welcome back to UE5 BP Guru. Today we're going to be covering our uh, Ringmon battle code. Um, we're going to be covering lots of stuff. This is going to be a few episodes um, and we're going to be covering a lot of information. So I will go as slow as I can. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to join the Discord and I will be more than happy to help you uh, there. So this is my battle world. Uh, if you haven't got one already, create a new level, set up however you want, um, and you're going to need a few things for setup. This is a trainer, by the way. It's it's not relevant at this point. Uh, well, it will be. That's that's a lie. I do apologize. That's a lie. We are going to be setting up trainers and encounters, wild encounters, all at the same time because it uses the same code. So what do we need to start off with? Well, ignoring the trainer stood there for a second. We need a, a few different cameras, right? So we can switch between the scene. So like, wait, we want to see the attacking ringmon. We want to see our player throwing balls. We want the encountered started. You know, you set these things up how you want. You need to decide what cameras you want, how they're going to move around your scene and how um, and what you're going to use and when you're going to use it. But ultimately, uh, I will just show you how to switch the cameras out but you need to set up your own cameras and decide how you want it to move around your scene and where you want to place them. That's your decision. I've also created a couple of, um, if I go into the map and go to the battle map, there is a couple of things you're going to need here. I've got a, pl a party spawn target. I've got an enemy spawn target. I have a uh, battle proxy. And the rest is just random. They, they're covered in other tutorials. I'm, I'm not going to bother covering them in this one. They're not beneficial to the battle code. But um, those other three are. So we've got a party spawn target here, which is where our, our party is going to spawn. And I've given it a tag. So if you scroll down to the bottom somewhere, it should have tag. Where is it? Let me um, load this up here. Uh, let's just type in the search tag. Oh, no, it doesn't. Uh, no, I tell a lie, it doesn't. The reason it doesn't is because um, we're just going to call this one thing. That's why. Okay, never mind. But we do on our player spawn. So wherever you want your third person character to spawn, you'll need to put a, uh, a tag on it. Uh, you can search. You can just search tag, but find the tag, create one, and call it player spawn. Case sensitive matters, spaces matter. You call yours whatever you want to call it. You just need to remember exactly how you called it. So, for example, mine is capital P player, no space, capital S, spawn. That's how mine's labeled. You label yours how you want to, but it has to be exact, okay? That's going to be important for in a moment. We then have these two BPs I've created. They've just got billboards in them. One is called party spawn target. And the other one is called spawn target. It doesn't matter what you call them. They don't require tags, but they are just standard BPs. And then I have another BP, uh, not that one. Where is it? It's not spawned in. That's probably why it doesn't matter. It's just the battle proxy. It's just a blueprint. It's just a blank blueprint actor. Um, we're, which we're going to put all of our battle code into in a moment. I've already got it open for uh, use in a moment. Uh, and that's pretty much all you need at this time. What is that? Okay, that's the, the skybox. Uh, so, yeah. So, this is all you need, okay, um, to get the code working, okay? You set your cameras up, as I said, but ultimately, you just need two spawn targets. One called party spawn, one called spawn target. You need to set up a blueprint actor for your battle proxy target. And you also need uh, your player start. Once you have all that, Once you have all that, we can move on into the next section. Now, I said we're going to set up trainers. Now, my trainers work very similarly to the creatures in the sense that um, if we go into our... I've set mine up in here in the blueprints. We've got trainers here. Uh, we've got a trainer strut. Uh, I will go through every one of these in the strut. So we've got trainer ID. We have trainer name. We have encounter dialogue, we have win dialogue, we have lose dialogue, we have defeated dialogue. Those are all string uh, variables. We then have a win money integer, we have a lose money integer, 
and then we have a boolean that is that checks to see if it's been defeated or not that is all you need for your trainer at this point in time that's all i have at the moment um the next thing you're going to need is to open up your npc master you are going to want to add a party struct structure and a your trainer struct structure to your npc the party stu strut structure is the same structure we use for our players party. It's exactly the same. They're just it's just it's just going to be unique to our trainers. Uh, and then we have our trainer information, which again is just what we uh, spoke about in the structure. It's just your trainer ID, trainer name, encounter um, dialogue, etc. Um, okay. With that, I'm not going to go and show you in the in the grass section in the overworld section sorry i'm not going to go back into to show you what i've set mine up as you set yours up as you want to okay you set up your own trainer name you set up your own trainer dialogues and your own uh, amount of money you want to win or lose the um the only thing is with the party strut you need to decide what re uh po creatures pokemon ringmon whatever you want to call it you need to decide what's going to appear what level it's going to be you need to know the name of it you know the class reference it doesn't have to have all the information like weights and dex entries and you know it just needs to know the essential stuff so like name level um and um i think that's it to be honest but it still needs to have all that uh, basic information where you want to pull through uh into your world okay once you've got all that and you're happy your npc is created uh, we can open up the master and we can start doing some stuff. So the first thing you want to do is add in your skeletal mesh of the character you want to have appear. You also want a collision box so that you um, can collide with it and obviously click enter, etc. You know, whatever you need to do. We're obviously going to get those collision boxes and all we're going to do is enable input and disable input using the player controller. Very simple stuff. We've covered this many a time before. Not a lot of this should be uh, alien to you at this point. Now, this has got some of the dialogue stuff in there. I know I said I wasn't going to really cover that in this series. <coughs> because your games need to be unique. You don't want them to copy mine. You need to... As much as you're copying the code so you know what to do, you do need to kind of think for yourselves a little bit in terms of how you want your games to differ. You don't want to create a hundred games the same. You want yours to be unique. Okay, so things like uh, particle systems, animations, and dialogue boxes will all be on you guys. You need to think that through and how you want to implement them and when you want them to appear, what styles you want. That needs to be on you guys. But I will show you this ref this this uh, situation of what I'm doing. Okay, just so yours is the same as mine, in the sense that you can interact and get your uh, trainer battles to show up. So we have our trainer information. We're pulling that through to check if it's been defeated. If it hasn't, we're going to obviously move on uh, and do what we want to do. But if we, if it has, we want to uh, get our trainer name and dialogue. We put, I put mine through to my dialogue widget. Again, you need to decide how you want to do that. And of course, I add it to the viewport. And then after three seconds in my dialogue widget, I actually destroy itself. It removes itself from the parent. So I only ask it to wait three seconds before we actually can get rid of it, okay? The three seconds di delay basically is um, uh, is to stop it from me from just keep pressing enter and doing stuff. It just stops the code from ending for a few seconds longer. Then on the fail, so if we haven't defeated him and he's ready to battle, we do a different dialogue widget. Which again, we add to the viewport. We delay for a few seconds so that it can run through the text. And then we roll for our final trainer stats. Now this is important because if we don't roll the trainer stats, when he does, when, they're, when their enemy's ringmon does damage, it won't do anything. It'll always add up to zero. So this is very similar to what we've done many a times before. But um, it's just set up slightly different. So we come in straight away to a sequence because i want it to go through the whole party so i want it to work out the first ring ones uh final stats the second one the third one the fourth one etc depending on how many he has 
and we check that by doing a slot set. So if, when you're setting up your Ringmon, your trainer's Ringmon parties, you need to make sure that you check that slot set uh, to true so we know that there's a Ringmon in that slot. Because if you don't, it's always going to come back false and do nothing, right? So it's only going to do this for the Ringmon you have set, which is great. So we always want to come off the true. And then we're going to roll those stats, okay? And I've, I've set up the same function because it goes in and back out. And then we set the different slots as a member. So um, what we do first is we get the trainer party. We break it to get the party strut. So we get all six slots. And I'm only going to show you slot one. You should be able to replicate it for slot two, three, four, and five, and six, etc. So slot one comes up. We do the slot set in the branch. We then take... Um, oh, this looks a bit weird. No, it is right. Sorry, we take slot one, and that goes into this roll stat, slot stats function. Now I'm going to open up the function and show you what's happening inside. I haven't done the math expression because I haven't updated everything yet. I'm still going through and updating a lot of stuff. But um, it's very similar to all of our other code in the sense that we get the base stat data table. That slot one comes in. We break it. We get the party info. We break our creature information to check that the name matches up to the base stat data table. When that comes back true, we re-get that base stat data table via the row name. And then we pull off and we break our base stats. The IV comes from our creature IV. And then we should have everything. We do. I do get another basic information so we can get the current level. You could just get it from this as well. I was just trying to keep things as tidy as I could. But uh, it's here again. And once we've got all three of the, that information, we do the normal code we've covered a thousand times. Uh, which is the Pokemon math. There's one for HP and one for all the other stats. Um, I covered it in the last uh, episode anyway, where we did the encounter battle stats. So just copy the same code. You can literally copy and paste that math over. And then we're setting our final stat information. Because I'm making the party strut, I need to make sure that every other field is getting added back in. So the slot set, creature, creature EVs, IVs, base stats, info, and party index all need to be replugged back in to make sure that it's all passed through into the out. So, yeah, hopefully that's made sense. It's exactly, as I said, it's exactly the same thing we did in the last episode with the encounter BP. It's no different. I'm just not using the fancy math expressions, but you can use the math. You can literally copy and paste the math expression over into here and just copy them in and use them all the same as always okay it's no different uh and then that's oh where have i gone i've gone onto the wrong thing here haven't i no i haven't no i haven't I've, i have yes i have sorry 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 so that slot one goes in and it comes back out okay um if you want to add those in it is literally you can click on the function and you have an input and an output of trainer info in and trainer info out and it is just the party info structure. That's all it is. Um, once that comes back out, we need to set our trainer party. But we're just setting the member of slot one. Okay. And you can literally just drag out your party, your trainer party variable. And plug that in to either side and set it the other side. As simple as that. And just repeat it down. You don't need to set up six functions. You can use the same function. Because when it <coughs> because it's not getting set on the inside of this function, the slot one information goes in, it comes back out and gets set. And on the second one, the slot two information goes in and comes back out. You shouldn't have any issues with that as long as you're making sure it does go fully through it. If you're setting it inside the function, you're going to have an issue and you would have to make multiple functions. But um, yeah, do it the way I've done it um, and you shouldn't have any issues and that should set the whole team's final stats for you and we can go back into our event graph and move on now you'll notice that this save information is relatively similar to the encounter information in the sense we are saving all the same uh, third-person party information 
I have added player money in there. That's because I added a new variable into the third person character so I can uh, finally have money in the game. I have a monetary value now within the game. Um, so you need to add that to your save party information in your save party save file. Um, you need to add a new variable, hook it all up just like you did everything else. Uh, and we have now got a new save trainer information save file. This is passing through again into the game instance. And although that's warning, I haven't fixed that yet. It's just passing mainly over the trainer party and the trainer info. That's what we need to pass through uh, into this save party information. Okay. Um, and that's, just, that's the gist of it, basically. So as long as you've got this save file information set up, you should be good to go. Now, I did talk about this at the end of the last episode. I'm very quickly going to go back through it. So we have a BPI we set up. If I go, if I find it in the blueprints, where is it? There you are. Interface BPI, I called mine. Um, if we go into it, we have now got the save trainer information uh, BPI. We have the save party information BPI, which is all of those uh, variables. And we have the save encounter information uh, as well. And then the save trainer info. Again, like I said before, you need to go into the class settings. You need to go to the right hand side where the details panel is, find inherited interfaces and add that interface BPI into the trainer master BP before you can utilize these messages. It's the same for the encounter BP and it's the same for the game instance. They all need to have that saved in their class settings. So we're going to open up the game instance now and take a look in here. Okay, so we have um, this is the encounter save. So this is what you should have coming in. Create the save game object, set the encounter, uh, select the encounter, set the creature information, set the creature stats, set the creature IVs, set the creature final stats, set the encounter save that comes directly from here, promote it to a variable, and then you can use that to plug into save game to slot. And then we, mine's called encounter slot and then index number is 101. And then it's the open level with the grass battle level name. Now, these two have changed a little bit. The reason is, is that this information needs to remain. So uh, we don't want to delete our save file anymore. Otherwise we lose our monetary value every time we save. So now we say, does ha uh, save game exist? Uh, we check it from our party slot 201 branch. If it's true, then we load that game slot uh, that game slot we cast to the party save and we set that information from this load game from slot. If it does not exist, so it comes off the false, we create the save game object instead and we do what we did before exactly the same, uh, including that player money variable that you need to add to your party save. And then we just save the game to slot party slot index 201. It's no different, but it's just adding this little bit extra here so that we don't override our save file now. Um, same goes here in the trainer information. We, do, we say, does save game exist? Um, and we check that via trainer slot and our user index is 301 for this save file. If it does not, we create the save file and we set our trainer information, trainer party, trainer mesh, and trainer save, just like we did for all the other ones. And then we save game to slot trainer slot 301 and open up the grass level. If it does exist, again, we load game from slot, trainer slot 301, cast to the trainer save file so we can get the variables, uh, and exactly the same thing, set the trainer save, pull off from the trainer save, and save game to slot, trainer slot 301, open the level. So, yeah, the only one we don't need to open the level up is the, uh, the party save file. Uh, that's the only thing we don't need to load the train off, uh, load the open level from. Every, all the other ones we do. So now that we've got that, you should have your information saved. So what are we gonna do with that information? Now, I think a lot of you in the older episodes um, had it that we opened up all of our information from our grass battle level um, BP. Um, but it's moved into the battle proxy now. So let's have a look at the grass battle level and what's actually going on in here. So we have event begin play. We cast to the third person character. We set the third person character 
and um, so it's promoted to a variable and then we get the follow camera we set that to not active and we set this um, our vision to our camera actor if I remember correctly it is this one yeah camera actor okay so it shows the field first if uh, and then yeah we get the player control plug that in it says set view target with blend so it will always try and load that one first but if I'm perfectly honest it won't matter too much um, only if we're going into um, I believe it's only if we go into a train of battle but it shouldn't matter too much right the next thing we do is we have a sequence we have three nodes on that sequence the first one goes up to our party slot again index 201 we cast that party save game we set uh, is encounter from the party save we get our creature party and we set the ring mom party in there uh, from our third person character we save, uh, we get our target of our party, uh, our player money, and we set our player money as well to our third person character. This just keeps those values alive, okay? Uh, mainly the is encounter and the player money. The ring mom party is useful because we need that information for the battling. Um, we then get the third person character. We check to see, is it an encounter? And then we do a branch. If it's true, we get all actors of uh, NPC master and we do a get we the target is obviously the uh, mpc and we set that skeletal mesh to nothing you'll see in my grass battle level i have pulled out that master mpc bp and put it into a place so that it stood there a bit like how our player will be when it's spawned in as well it was just easier to call that in for now um, where was I? Battle pros. If it is not an encounter, wait a minute. If it isn't an encounter, we load the game from slot, which is trainer slot 301. We cast to the trainer save game. We set that as a TSG variable. We get all actors of class and we get the NPC master. We get the reference. We obviously get the NPC. Set skeletal mesh of asset to our save trainer mesh. Now, this actually doesn't work at the moment, so this is subject to change, but it's more about making sure that the skeletal mesh is there. Uh, what I was trying to do was get it to update its um, material. I know how I'm going to do that, so that will come up in an updated um, episode. And finally, off the final pin, number two, we are spawning our player in. So again, we pull off set actor transform, Get player character, get game mode, find player start. Again, player spawn, make sure it's spelt correctly to that tag on your player spawn, um, on your uh, player start. Make sure you add the tag to your player start and make sure that it's spelt correctly in here. So my, again, mine was capital P player, no space, then it's uh, capital S spawn. Get the actor transform, plug that in. Then... We set input mode to UI only so that we're only using our battle widgets. We set the show mouse cursor to true and then we spawn actor battle proxy target, uh, which is just, again, the battle proxy target blueprint we should have now set up, which is this thing here. So, yeah, that's all it takes uh, to get to this point. Um, I've gone through it pretty quickly, so just slow the video down, pause when you need to so you can catch up and you should be okay. Um, now we need to um, get the battle proxy target set up. Now, you don't need to drag one of these into the world. You can literally... Sorry, I'm just checking. I'm, I am actually recording with a microphone. Otherwise, this would be painful to go back through. <laughs> so we're, um, we're getting a billboard on there so we can see it in the world. But actually, I realize you don't need one because we don't have to drag it in. We actually just spawn it into the world using this, um, this part here. It's just spawned at 000000. It doesn't matter where it spawns. It really will have zero effect on anything because we're just using it to run our battle code through. Now, you will need to set up, of course, a. if I go into my widgets, you will need to set up your own... Uh, do, 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 where is it? Uh, you will need to set up your own battle widget that has your 
information on here. So I've got like health bars, experience bars, levels, names, uh, genders on here. I've got attack, run, inventory, party, capture, and the move names. Okay, the move, and they're all buttons. Okay, these this slot down here is all buttons. So I'll show you this first before we actually get into the code. Now, the main thing is, is uh, I, again, I've shown this all off before. It's not set up quite ready for... Um, uh, da, 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 where are we? Oh, interesting. Okay, weirdly this does work, and I've just realized I've seen an error in here, but that's okay. I will fix that down the line. So, from the run, so if you're going to run, it's literally just a case of setting the, the game mode back to, to game, setting the UI back to game mode, hiding the cursor, removing all the widgets, and then opening up that level. Inventory doesn't really matter at the moment. Uh, what's this one? That's not relevant until the capture. That is going to be relevant in a moment. And then we've got our attack button. So what we want to do is we want to say is attack active. If it's false, we want to, uh, if it's true, sorry, if it is, if it is active, we just want to hide any buttons and text, set the visibility to hidden and set active, uh, attack active back to false. This is, that's just a blueprint Boolean I've set up. Uh, and then I've got an inventory active. So that again, not relevant at the moment. So let's just focus on the attacking. You've got attack active set to true. Um, we're then cast into our third person character to get the ring mom party, which is slot one. Um, you obviously get the player character from that object. Uh, we're breaking that information to get the character creature info, and then we're getting our move slots. We set the visibility to hidden for all the other buttons that may potentially be open. So like, uh, mainly inventory stuff, but again, not relevant at this point. You should only be worrying about your attack buttons. So drag that into your for each loop, um, plug the move slots into it, and we're going to loop uh, into this sequence, okay? Zero, one, two, and three. That's all you need, one for each move. And what I'm doing here is I am uh, saying, does our array index equal to zero? And if that comes back true, we should be setting a move. And you can repeat this dance, one, two, three, we're doing that check to make sure this array index actually has a relevant move. If it does, we are going to take the move name. Uh, da, 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 da. We want the, the move PP I haven't done because I haven't got PP in my game. So ignore the PP section. All we want to do is get that move name, drag it to get to text name, and we want to set text of the move slot for text. And we also want to set the button to visible, okay? So pull off from the text, set that, and get the move name and plug it in, okay? It should look like this. And you can do this for every single one. Just plug it into the set, but just make sure you're making sure the relevant text and button are visible and set, okay? That's what it should look like. So you've got move uh, slot two button, move slot two text. Okay, move slot text needs to plug into the text and the set visibility. If you don't set the visibility of the text, you'll just have a blank button, even if it is set correctly. Um, and it's just setting the name and the visibility, depending if we have it. If in mine, mine set up so if I don't have a move, it doesn't show me the button. Um, so that's just how I've got mine set up. And that is just to get your buttons to appear. Once you've got your buttons to appear, we're going to have to send a message to our battle code. So to do that, we're going to create a new blueprint interface like this. And you just need the MS press move slot press. Um, and that's all you need. It's, it's just got to be a use item. Uh, where is it? Let's actually, it's just a move slot press. And it's just a function that we can buy, uh, pass some information through. So let's go back into our battle widget. Um, we want to set up um, a button for each move. Obviously, you should have move slot one, two, three, and four. 
we want to create a new boolean called move active we want to see if it's false if it's true we don't want to do anything we want it to be false and what we're going to do is set our move active to true we're going to set our move id to two one or zero one two or three depending on which one we're using so mine is set up to be move slot one is three move slot two wherever that is it's not in the right order is two two is two four is zero and three is one so that's your move id there set move id once you've set your move id and that the move is active we get all actors of class which is the battle proxy we get now we should only ever have one we make sure it's valid if it is valid we do a move slot press we just activate that move slot press and in this one i'm setting all of my move slot buttons and text to hidden okay and then you should repeat that for every single one just making sure that you are changing that move id to match um whatever is down here zero one two or three should match up here uh, and that will activate your button and this and obviously hide the buttons in the same at the same time so once we've done that essentially our move is working okay it's activated but now we need to tell the battle code which move we're using and for it to do something okay and this is where the fun part comes into play we can go to our event graph. Now, before I do any battling, the battling will probably be in the next episode because this episode is already getting very long. I'm just going to start um, with this uh, setup, okay? So we come off the event, begin play. We cast our third person character and promote that to a variable called TPC, okay? We, get, we check to see if it's an encounter, so pull off that is encounter. If that's true, we know it's an encounter. If it's false, we know it's a trainer battle. <coughs> excuse me um we then want to sp we'll, we'll do encounter first and then we'll go trainer we spawn our encounter okay this is the code that was originally in the battle level okay we want to load the game from slot which is encounter slot 101 we cast our encounter save game we get all actors of class which is uh enemy spawn uh target we do a get now it can be zero because we know there's only one in the world we get the actor location and we plug that into a spawn actor we pull off we get our creature information we get that ringmon class and plug that into the spawn actor okay that's what's driving the spawn then we need to set all its information so pull off from this return value we should have it uh, we promote it to a variable called encounter ringmon we want to also get our ringmon information creature ivs final stats and set them all using the information that's coming from the save. So again, creature IVs, creature final stats, creature stats. They all get plugged in. Uh, then we want to set a variable that we created in our third person character called current ringmon. And we also want to update the mesh. I'll show you that in a second. But we then want to pull off from that set and we want to make a ringmon build. Okay, we plug everything in. The only thing we don't have to worry about is the EVs. All right, everything else is important not that EV and the mesh comes also from this is the target and that information is our basic information strut which is coming from this ringmon info we have here okay so once we've set that we follow it along and it goes into our update mesh and the update mesh is just setting the material of uh, depending whether it's shiny or not so again break that information is shiny goes into the branch uh, the target is that mesh that's being pulled in from the spawn actor um we then plug that in to the target for every one and the materials are the materials we are have set in this info strut i know i'm going fast guys but i i it's um there's a lot to cover once we've done that we should be good okay we can then go back into the event graph and i've created a camera switch which um is just basically setting our third person characters um uh i should probably go backwards here a little bit let's go back into the world level oh up here i didn't cover this i have a camera switch i've set up 
And what this does is it changes the, the active camera. Again, this is all dependent on you guys, but this for me is just a uh, view set view target and I'm setting each camera based on a Boolean that's stored within my third person character. Okay, so I have a party active, enemy active, trainer active, uh, enemy trainer start, uh, enemy uh, e-start camera, you know, it's all dependent on where I'm looking at the, mo at the time. And in my battle widget, no, not my battle widget, my battle you, battle proxy, Jesus, I'll get there in the end. Um, all I've done is I've got each one of those um, booleans that I'm using to drive, which camera is being looked at at the time, and I'm plugging them directly into this node, okay, this input node. Uh, so that I can um, get them on the other side. So if I go back to the event graph now, if I change what's ticked, it'll change where the camera is, uh, which camera is active at that time. So I'm obviously making the enemy start active so that I can see which creature is being spawned that, from the wild. I set a delay just so that you get a bit of time looking at that creature. And then I do a dialogue, which doesn't really matter at this point. Um, and that's all I need to do for the enemy encounter, okay? I spawn it, I look at it, and that's it, okay? And then we're going to switch back to the player, or the, our, our trainer, okay? Before we spawn whichever creature we want to spawn. Then we do our trainer fight start dialogue, which again, it really doesn't matter at this point. Uh, let's close a few of these down so I can see what I'm clicking on. Uh, again, dialogue's down to you guys. Uh, but I do do a three second delay after that dialogue, so um, it gives a chance for it to play out. Um, then I've got. I'm looking at the enemy ringmon. I do a delay of a second just so I get to have a good look at it. Then I'm checking my. Um, I'm checking my. I'm just double checking. Or I'm telling you the right information. I'm checking the trainer team and to do that I'm loading the game from slot the trainer slot 301 I'm casting to the trainer safe game and I'm getting that trainer party variable and setting it okay setting it to a train trainer party um, variable that I've created within this um, blueprint okay so I'm passing it from the trainer save file and putting it into our battle proxy trainer party they're called the same thing but they are different variables okay i'm not just setting the same variable otherwise you'd see a target on here and this would be going into it okay so this is a new variable we're setting up in here which is exactly the same thing it is that party strut type then we're going into a branch and what we're looking for is we are looking for uh, a ringmon that has full health now because it's the trainer's party the first one should always have um, health, okay? But it will set that, uh, if I drag this down, we're getting the final stats to get that health value. And then we're taking that party slot index and we're setting it to current trainer index. It's a new variable that's an integer. Again, this is important for when we switch the trainers out down the line when they their ringmon die, okay? Uh, and then once we're happy, we've got a selected ringmon we get the slot and it goes into the selected slot return node which again is just um the party info strut and you replicate that down changing out the slots and that's coming from our trainer party variable which we've just set here okay so we set it there and then we get it there and break it and then we're basically breaking everything until we get to that hp value we're looking for uh, and if we get to the end and none of them have health for some reason, we set the all party is dead to true. Okay, and that selected slot goes to false. It goes to nothing. Uh, and then back in here, we are getting the party start dialogue, but we don't need to worry about that because that's dialogue. <coughs> what we do need to do now, though, is spawn the trainer creature. And we feed that selected slot into here. And then what we're doing is we're breaking it uh, to, we're breaking that party info strap. We are getting the enemy spawn target. We're getting it. Zero index for it again. Get all actors location. And we're spawning that actor 
Um, and that is the transform. The transform goes into there. That location goes into that transform. We break that party information. We break the creature information. And we get the ringmon class. And that goes into there. Very similar to the encounter now. We get we set that to a new um, variable called trainer ringmon. We set the ringmon information. The creature IVs. The creature EVs. And the creature final stats. Uh, we do not need to update the mesh. Because there's no shinies involved. So it will just take the original. Um, and then we're pulling all this information out. The IVs, EVs, final stats, and the creature information comes out of this as well. And we set that as our current ring mod. Okay, so it's like the encounter, we're setting that current ring mod. It's so we have something to focus on when we're pulling variables out and things like that. Um, and all of that gets, again, made into a ring mod build. So it's exactly the same like the encounter. The only thing we don't have to do is set that update mesh because... We don't have a shiny version. We don't. They're never going to be shiny. Okay. Um, okay. So now you should have either an encounter or a trainer fight spawned in. We do a delay of three seconds, and then we're switching that camera to our trainer active. Okay. So they both go. They both feed into this camera switch, and the trainer active comes true, which is um, my player or you know the whoever the trainer is. That we're playing as our protagonist if you will and then we're checking his ring mon okay same sort of thing uh we're doing a branch we are getting our third person character uh, reference we're getting that ring mon party and we're breaking it and then we're again doing the same thing we're checking to see who has health okay because now we could potentially start with zero health as our first ring mon so it will ignore that one. If this one has health, then it will spawn that one. And then again, we're setting a current party index variable, which is an integer. And we are then feeding that slot, depending on which one we're going for, into the return node. And again, you just copy this all the way down. And then if that's true, we say all party is dead. If that's true, then um, we also say the selected slot is also blank. Okay. That's what we do if all of them come back as all dead. Uh, then again, I'm feeding that into my dialogue box. Again, I'm not covering dialogues. But then we do a delay. And then we switch the camera to the party active, which is where our party's creature camera is. And then we do a delay of a second just so we have a chance to obviously play a particle effect or whatever we want to do. And then we spawn our party creature which again is very similar. We're feeding that selected slot through. Party, spawn, target, zero. We get the actor location rotation and we spawn an actor based on that. If you're wondering why I've got three different pins, it's because if you click right click on the spawn transform, you normally have a um, break pin option. And then it'll give you the location rotation separately. We break that party information. We get the ringmon info, basic info. We get that ringmon class and plug it in. All the other ones, as exactly the same stuff is happening again, guys. We set that as a new variable called party ringmon. We set the ringmon info, ringmon IVs, ringmon EVs, and the final stats. And then we update our mesh. Now, we do want to update the mesh this time because we want to um, set the shiny. And that's the same thing as the... Um, that's the same thing as the... Uh, da -da -da -da, what's it called? The um, encounter check, okay? We check to see if it's shiny. If it is, we set those meshes or the materials, should say them. Okay, once we've set that, we set a new selected party mon variable, which is again the party info struct type. It's a new variable we want to create. And this is where we're going to store. So we had our current ring mon that we were fighting, and we have our selected party mon that we want to focus on. We want to focus on those two from this point on. Uh, and then we make that party information and we have to we this time we have to update our party slot index slot set and all the other bits of information as well Great now once you've done all that you should also have your Creature spawned in and from there I do a dialogue check which I haven't got that far yet. I'm still working on that and we s Oh, no, sorry We create our battle widget Like so we that's our battle widget so we actually do want to do that. So you want to create a, bat a widget, 
which is going to be our battle widget that we've this this one here okay we want that one to appear so we select that one we get the player controller plug that in we then promote it to a variable because we are going to want to use that down the line and that becomes our battle ui and then we add it to the viewport and that is the event begin play completely sorted okay so most of what was happening in the grass battle level is now moved on into here so by the end of this you should be able to spawn and encounter all the the enemy trainers first ringmon um and then spawn our ringmon as well okay as i said i'm not covering dialogue i'm not covering particle of particle effects or animations at this point and i might not okay because your game should be unique you should have it flow the way you want to you shouldn't have to copy mine to get your result you should be able to just um come up with your own okay it's got to be unique for yourself uh, otherwise it's not going to be your game anymore it's going to be my game because you're just copying me okay it's not about copying me this is about opening your mind up and helping you uh to formulate an idea of how to do this okay your game will be different it's not going to be the same uh, i'd imagine this is just purely to open your minds up how to do this um and then you should take this information and utilize it yourselves but um, well, this is where we're going to stop for today because I think we're probably well over the hour mark. But um, at this point, you should have all three creatures spawned. If you are still having issues, please feel free to join in my Discord. I'll put the, the links in the uh, description and you can ask me any questions. I'm more than happy to help. Um, but thank you so much, guys, for watching. Uh, I hope this has been very helpful to you. And I will see you in the next episode. Take care. Bye.